Amina uh, is going to present um, <coughs> communication entitled Made by Architects, Modified by People, a Grammar for User Intervention. Um, Isabel will present a communication entitled Collaborative Mapping with Smartphones, an Artistic Approach. And Adriana Afonso um, will present a communication title, Graph Theory Applied to the Methodology of Landscape Planning. Um, as Camila is missing, I think we will be on time for the rest of the schedule. Uh, so you will have time for walk in the city before. <laughs> So we will keep, we'll try to keep the schedule on, uh, on time for uh, the rest of the program. Um, thank you again for being here, for resisting the third day, the most difficult one, <laughs> where everybody is starting to get tired. And uh, uh, Amina, when you were ready, thank you for your uh, collaboration. Thank you for being here also. And um, uh, we are all waiting for your presentation. Okay. Hi everyone, my name is Amina. I'm from uh, Istanbul Technical University and today I will be presenting you the early stages of my PhD research. Uh, so, doesn't work. Okay. So this is Climat de France, a, compl uh, a housing, a huge housing complex in Algiers, uh, built by the French architect Fernand Puyon during 1954 and 1957. Uh, so this project was a part of the Tenor Chevalier's intensive housing projects in which local people were relocated from slums where they, res uh, where they used to live to modern house houses during the last period of French coloni colonial rule in Algeria. And here, did it change? Huh. And here you see a picture from Stéphane Couturier uh, in 2011. So you can see the evolution of the project during all those years. So uh, there is Latour's, um, re one of his articles is talking about the photographic gun, Marnie's photographic gun and how it doesn't exist in architecture. We always see building aesthetic objects and we, we cannot uh, see their processes, evolution, and how they age with time or how they transform. So I was, uh, so this is just a small uh, reference that intrigues me. And uh, I, I used to work with shape grammars. Uh, am I still working with them? So uh, Rudy in the first day and Rui in the second day already gave us an introduction about shape grammars. But um, in my case, I'm mostly interested in the notion of the architectural grammar since it extends spaces shaped with both material and immaterial contexts. So I'm seeking for that potentiality of the special grammar in documenting this process of, uh, of the building, in my case, uh, my case study, which is Climat de France. So, yeah, <laughs> I think that's it. So in order to understand uh, the user intervention, I think that it's important to briefly introduce the architecture of the building. So, and the architect, I won't talk about him uh, as much, but he is an important figure. So this is initially the project, uh, which wasn't completely built. So this down part of the street has been built. The rest has never been realized, but still it's a huge complex. I mean, it's a huge neighborhood. Uh, and I will be focusing on the 200 colons only. So I will be focusing on this huge block because in my visits to the site, it was really hard to get in these dense uh, settlements. So, so this is the plan and the elevation of the 200 colons. 
Um, it's a 261 meters length with a 66 meter width uh, block. It has uh, 57 blocks and uh, 48 of them are repetitive. So 48 of the blocks are the same and he have different solutions on edges. The rest is all repetitive. And uh, his architecture mainly consists of two main grids. So he has a one to 100 to 100 grid which regulates the columns and the facade openings. And on the other hand, he has this 60 to 60, which is too small, you can't see it, grid, a structural grid, which define all the interior partitions of the units. So these are, these are pictures from uh, the construction. You see the columns. And here you can see the slab construction and the 60 to 60 grid and the divisions. So one block of these 40, uh, 48 blocks consists of nine meters. It's nine meters uh, length, sorry. Yes, so once we have, uh, you have the staircase in between and e uh, one apartment on each side. So we have three meters on one side, 240 for the stairs, and then five, uh, 360 for the other uh, apartment. And majorly in his facade, we have three main openings. One for uh, the apartments, the living areas, the other for the staircase, and uh, a last one that he introduced uh, on the upper level of the housings, of the houses. So as you see, it's a very repetitive and very strict architecture that we have here. So when we go back to the people, to the residents of this project and what they have been doing, um, I will need to first see the existing layout in detail to understand uh, the kind of environment they, they are living in. So this is a 25 meter square apartment with a 1.9 uh, meter square wet area. So this is the toilets, the bathroom, and everything that you need. So you have a tight kitchenette, a living area, and one bedroom. So this is the, the, the layout of most of um, the apartments, which is populated by uh, crowded Algerian families. So, uh, in material culture, I, I've been searching this in many different uh, disciplines, and in material culture, uh, user interventions are usually referred to as self-expression, as the user, the inhabitants, use this kind of intervention in order to belong, in order to feel uh, that th they are a part of the space, and the space is there, so there is this uh, dialectic between the building and the residence in the case of the social housing. So, um, and in this case, I think that the, the residents of Climat de France expressed, the, expressed themselves very powerfully. So, uh, when we get to the user interventions, I uh, well, I categorize them under three main uh, groups. So the first one is the, the most powerful one, let's say, or the strongest, which is the extension. So they have extensions on ground level, on rooftops, and on balconies, of course. Uh, the second one is opening modification. So this is on the facade level. level. They only play with the openings which already exist, so they kind of change them. And the third one is the attachment in which, in this case, they just don't uh, play with anything that's existing, but they keep adding attachment to the surface. In some cases, it's fences for um, security. In others, it's shading elements, so it can differ. But mainly to study with it, I have three categories. Uh, 
Yeah, so this is when first it's um, inhabited. And then in 2017, I was there. So this is the last part. But in between, we have many layers. We have an archaeology of <laughs> interventions made by you, the user. And here you see this is the rooftops, which I was talking about. So this is the first level. Then we have the openings as the second. And finally, the attached elements on the surfaces. So in order to problematize this and relate it with shape parameters, which are really formal, so I'm talking about something, a social problem that's there and trying to associate it with a formal one, a formal solution. So I go back to Ingold, which says that a form is a result of something, thoughts, process, and motivations Material, materialize the form. So in this case, we have a motivation which causes a form. So the, the form, in my case, is reappropriation. And the motivation is the special, spe special needs of the residents. So for these needs, uh, it's still an ongoing project. That's why I just invented a couple of concepts. But I will have uh, interviews, so I will have more concrete uh, attributes to this. But here I introduce uh, safety, practicality, lack of space, light control, aeration, and privacy, as far as I can see from the outside. And as, a re and as forms of reappropriation, we have the extensions, facade modifications, enclosed balconies, shading elements, and fences. So then I relate these two, I mean, one intervention can be caused by one or more needs of the residents. Uh, just one second. So in order to translate these interventions, we can move uh, into a reappropriation grammar. A bottom-up approach of their making process is adopted. Uh, and when we look into the making grammars, uh, we see uh, when we focus on the making process, we see Knight and Steiny's Nothing Grammar, in which they adapt shape grammars for computing shapes to a making grammar for computing things. So here we are computing things as well, which are the user interventions I've been talking about. So in Knight and Steiny's study, shape grammars deals with things through a process, and this process constitutes of doings and sensing processes. So in shape grammars, we deal with 2D shapes. We have the drawing, and in sensing, we have seeing. So we see, we do. And in nothing grammars, this transforms into uh, the doing process is nothing, which is defined by looping and pulling. And in sensing, we have touching. So we have grasping, focusing, and attention repositioning, etc. Uh, in my case, uh, I propose, we propose, a, um, th uh, we propose as things the user appropriation and is doing, we have tools, compet competences for now. I will be, um, I will tell you about four making uh, uh, rules, but this tool and competences is a little bit complex, more complex. I've been exploring it in another paper. And then I have sensing a special needs, which we already talked about. Uh, so I will try to uh, exemplify these rules. So in the first level of reappropriation, first of all, the, the doing rules are uh, should start with breaking. So we need to break what's existing in order to redefine it or remake it. Then I introduce the pro. So in this case, we have this opening on the ground floor, and we break it first. Then we enlarge it, redefine it. So we redefine the opening according to our expected modifications. Then we place, redefine it extend it, and finalize it. Here in repair, I'm mostly talking about finishing elements. So here we have a linear. Uh, so making is a continuous time-based 
process. And the grammars, on the other hand, um, just stop at uh, one defined, a specified frame of time and show us one output. So this is just a fragment of, of what could be happening infinitely. I mean, as many as users we have. So these are examples of uh, extensions. And in the second level of reappropriation, uh, I have the same rules. So we have this breaking, redefining, fixing, and repairing. So we need to remove the existing opening or frame and then redefining. And here we have, due to the stone used on the facets, in fact, we have very um, defined opening redefinitions because the stone is restricting and helpful at the same time. So they make use of that. And then we have the new openings fixed and repaired accordingly. This can be an example. And finally, I have uh, the third reappropriation, in which this case, oh, I'm sorry, I have the wrong uh, image. We don't have any breaking, we only have fixing, so this is the wrong rule, sorry about it. <laughs> and uh, we, we, we just fix whatever we wish to the window. In this case, these are the shading elements, there are fencing around, etc. cetera. And, uh, well, we, we, we propose a user intervention grammar as a tool of documenting, understanding, and assessing the user-oriented adaptations in Climat de France. Uh, but we have so many questions, and I don't know how many of them we can handle through my PhD, but, well, uh, can this grammar transform the static view of a building? Can it embed all this information, I mean, going back uh, with uh, all the informations of the residents, how the population increased and decreased, how did it affect the building, etc., Or can it be used for a rehabilitation of the building is another question we are exploring. So, yeah, thank you so much for listening. That's it. Thank you. Olá, uh, we are speaking English or in Portuguese? What do you prefer? English. English? Yes. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. But for us now it's 11 a.m., but uh, for you it's 2 p.m., no? All right. 2, we 2 are... p.m. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we are very um, uh, thankful to be presenting this work uh, for you from here, from our lab. But we are in the School of Architecture and uh, Urbanism and Design from the University of Sao Paulo. We are a laboratory that is related with the landscape architecture uh, discipline group because we are inside a School of Architecture. But we're dealing, excuse me? Sorry, can you share your screen? Your screen? Yours. Because we are this one? Okay. okay, so our presentation will be about how do we apply the graph theory in a methodology of landscape planning. And this is the work that our research here, that uh, Adriana Sandri is doing her PhD under my device here in, this, in the program of uh, graduate studies. She's doing this work of research that is connected with a full branch of uh, research that we are developing that's trying to go ahead in how we can inform the landscape planning and landscape design uh, activities of, uh, for designs is mostly no. How we can uh, inform these activities with uh, more precise technical scientific tools. And so we are very, very interested in how we can use these models of uh, working with ecological inf information for making our works of planning and design more effective in way of work of dealing with these subjects. And one of those uh, works that we just uh, started here is that relates with how we can make these landscapes more effective for uh, getting this information 
from other areas of science for making this most uh, uh, best use of the can and how you can incorporate these environmental issues in this planning process and to the designs, of course, that came from this planning in the diverse of problems that only the landscape dimension can deal with it. So uh, I think that not only landscape, but mostly landscape is a very uh, creative way of working, of getting synthesis of this diverse of problems and try to expose them in a way that can be transformed in real uh, uh, plans and real projects. And so what we are trying to make here, how we put all these dimensions together, and of course, it's a very complex uh, bunch of problems, but we are trying to make this more clearly understood and clearly uh, manipulated for uh, this project. And so what we are trying to show today here for you in this presentation is part of this project and how this uh, Daniel, uh, Adriana, that's uh, by my side here, is going to be able to expose better how these tools will be applied for our work. As you can see in this chart, uh, this was one of our first hypotheses because we are dealing mostly with urban watersheds, and this is the watershed in an area in nearby Sao Paulo. It's, it's a very uh, dense area of branches, uh, rivers and creeks and all these waterways. And in a sense that the city is mostly in the parts of the uh, outskirts of the city where these problems of these uh, interventions in the natural systems where the original creek used to follow, they became a, a, a channel that straight, of course, because all these first interventions were mostly in the way of making the water more, uh, uh, you know, the drainage is mostly for the position of making the conveyance of the water. And so these works of engineering are now in a process of we're trying, what we're trying to do here is to see how we can make a next version of uh, engineering in structural pro uh, projects of our water drainage, for example, in a way that they can be transformed and understood in, in uh, models that can be more like with the natural process and how waters can gather the area, can approach this area, and also how you can transform these areas in a more multifunctional spaces. So, for example, this image here is one of the first uh, draft that we had did about how you can organize the multiple purpose of this space. It's, it's an area that the, by all this hydrological modeling is, per, is designed, is aimed to be a reservation pond for the runoff of the stormwater that gather in these areas. So instead of designing mostly a, a huge pool that can be uh, uh, collecting all this water, in a very uh, mechanical way of storing this water that and releasing it after, we are trying to make uh, new assumptions of how we can uh, put this uh, function of water reservation for the runoff of the stormwater reservation and how we can make this also a machine for uh, regenerating the waters and also how we can make this something that can be also viewed by people who live around these areas as something that can enhance their quality of life. They don't want to be uh, living nearby a huge pool that collects only the garbage and only the sediments and only the sewage that came from this area. But if you can transform this area in something like a uh, uh, an uh, attractive landscaping area with all, all these functions maintained, all these ideas of these functions could be something that we are trying to organize here. So I think that Adriana can go further now explaining how it can also uh, relate to the uh, graph systems, okay? So as Paulo said, 
when you see into a so you look into a lot, a lot of ways that you can go in. So you can look at the economical ways, you can look at the social ones, the ideological. So we are wondering how we can put together all these parts of the project into a methodology process. So we're discussing how to incorporate the theory of landscape ecology into the landscape and landscape plan, not only in the anthropological way, but also considering the human, the, that they, where they walk, what it's going to be like in this picture way that you can see people and they use this space, not only for control the water. So we propose a theory that use the usually draft theory to think what is the best place to select it to the project. So, and what is the public, what is public green area that you can select it in a world, in a universe, a lot, a lot of types of green areas that you can select it to act with the streams and the nodes, like this and um, the theory. So the first theory is, um, it's a proposal usually in ecology to, to better understand how the animals goes into point to another. So as you can see in this picture, as how one goes to the one point to another, where he is going to pass, how he is going to transpose the areas one green part to another. So that's the usual application of the graph theory into ecology. So we are thinking about how to applicate this theory and this knowledge into the urban areas. How we can think and measure how the humans can walk and usually use the space in to different points. So let me explain. Uh, so if you do, if you look at this one point B, you look at one point A, one point B, and you are wondering how it's easy to go to one point to the city to another. So the graph theory, you can measure the link. It's a difficult point, but as you can see, the, the lines, the green line is the links, and the points of uh, the black points is the nodes. So you, you can put a value each node, or as you can see. Which it can be a park, a green area, a square, a street, a central point in the city. And the links can be the streets, the rivers. So we can put value in these points as uh, so considering the like um, the size of the park, uh, considering the type of the area, the amount of vegetation. You can look at what you want and put a value in this node. So, if you want to go to one point to another, you go by links, like streets. In the streets, you can also put a value in the streets. How you can put the slope of the street so you can walk, the numbers of the buses that go through these links. So, you can put values and characterize these points. So, as you can see, if you look at one point, it is an example. This point A, if you want to go to another point of the square, it's the difficulty that you can achieve the another point of the square. So, as I, I was explained, you can choose a public park, a centrality, to make a craft theory to know how better to connect one public park to another. And how is the best options that you can go further in by streets, by um, taking off the streams and um, those kinds of different things. So, as you can see, you can put the graph to to measure what's the best options to achieve one point to another in city. We are going to explain in a, with an example to be more clear. So we are going to present one in Cantareira Park, that's in São Paulo also. This is the city of São Paulo, is the capital of São Paulo in Brazil. And as you can see, if you look at the north part of the city, you have a big uh, park called Cantareira Park. That uh, you can look in another map is the one of the biggest parks uh, that is urban park in the city, inside the city. 
in the island. Eh? No, you can see the effect of this vegetation in the temperature of the sea as showing this heat island. Urban heat island. So it's an area that has really big issues with urban houses and those kinds of things. At the moment, because we are not seeing your presentation you're running. Yes. I'm not seeing the slides. We are seeing only one image. The same Which one? one? The graph. I'm not changing the image. Landscape economy is landscape planning. Graph theory, cost surface. Ah, no, mm, you are same. not seeing the next. Uh, uh, let me stop and continue again. You are seeing now? What are you seeing now? You're seeing the map of the city of Sao Paulo? Yes, Brazil, Sao Paulo, Cantareira. Okay. Oh, so, right. it, and change it now? Yes, okay. It changed? Yes. All right. No. no. It didn't change. Yes. yes. Okay. All right, let's go. So, uh, as you can see, this is the uh, different types of um, maps that you can consider as like a node. What's the node in the graph tree? So you can select the green areas of the, like the biggest, biggest nodes is the Cantareira Park, that's the, the north part, the green. And you can select uh, different type of, types of nodes. So this square is the public park, that's the really inside of the city. And you can select things. We selected two things, the streets and the green distribution in the streets. You can put criteria in these links. As you can see, you can put, uh, we put two criteria just to example for the methodology. You put the slope of criteria, or as you are going to see the slope of streets. So we have the streets that has linear and streets that has a huge slope that the pedestrian will not walk away. And so we selected a tideway width. Let me show you for your details. So that's the base that's in north of São Paulo. And we select the nodes. Each of these green areas will be a node of the graph theory. So we'll be a node in the graph area. You can look at the land use of the city. The most of the party residential area is not so a commerce area. And you can select these. You can select uh, together with the squares and the, the public parks, you can select the schools, the residential areas to be the nodes of the graph theory. And the links, you are going to the streams, the links between the different nodes of the graph, and also consider the streets. But you can put a tag on the streets. How can I say? It's like a, you can put a sidewalk. So the pedestrian will go to the one node for another by the sidewalk. So we select the sidewalk that avoid that than two meters of the distance of the sidewalk. So in these links of the graph theory, we took off the, the sidewalks that are not higher than two meters. So you have this about these links and the stream to link the nodes that we selected, the graph theory. So putting together all these criteria, the nodes and the links, you can make a surface cost in the graph theory. Another criteria that you could show puts a value in the matrix is the street slope. We have voted, we have voted the more than 80% of the street slope, so it's a street that the person can walk slowly in a high sidewalk street. So we took off all the free slopes that higher than eight cents. So we make this. As you can see, this is a cluster face by the graph theory. All the um, red areas in this map is the areas that you, you avoid. The highest slope, you avoid the street that doesn't have the highest um, sidewalk widths, and you can connect all 
the areas that denote that you are interested in. So you connect green areas, the schools, the centralities. So if you want to go to one point to the map, to another, you can see the highest value in greens. So we can walk in the street that is with good slope, with uh, sidewalk that's more than two meters. And as you can see, you can make a different ways of what you can select in this project to be invested in. So if I, I want I, a planner, um, a landscape planner, I can see this map and see what is the best streets to select to invest in the project. And if you select like the nodes A, B and C, they are a huge part we call the forestal in Sao Paulo. So if you want to collect to see the best way to collect, to go to A, point A, point B or point B to point C using this criteria you can see this is the best way. Let me clarify with the basis. So you go to the point C to the point A with this carter. As you can see, you can go by the green areas, looking at the criteria that show you the scope, the width. So you can project the space, not only considering the ethical value, you can consider a multiple Manager. You can put a lot of types of criteria uh, to analyze the best way to, to one point to, another, to the city and see what's the best place to invest looking into the surface. And uh, this is an example. So, uh, indeed, we selected the, the not the high slope, the more um, flat. So as you see, can go to another point to another by this cost, surface cost. You can go on avoiding the high slope in this area A to C. So as a final remark, we think that this is a methodology that needs to be selected another criteria, like not only the slope, not only the width, but we can look at a different types of can look at the street that has more trees, that uh, we can look at different types of nodes. We can look at not only the green nodes, we can look into this, because we can apply this methodology to a huge amount of planning parameters in planning area. Yes. That's it. Uh, for if you have any questions, please. Thank you. Uh, thank you. And um, um, for your participation, and uh, uh, we'll be in touch. Thank you. Hi. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Isabel Carvalho, and I'm a researcher at SIAC uh, Research Center for Arts and Communication, and at Concinitas, uh, where I develop research exploring participatory and collaborative process. So, um, uh, I work with uh, uh, some tools, and one of them are uh, smartphones and tablets as a mobile communication uh, devices, um, equipped with GPS technology and uh, with um, uh, internet access. Uh, so we can have the ability to produce and reproduce images, um, content, information, um, and and I explore it uh, as an um, increasingly tool of urban exploration and experimentation. So. Uh, through that mobile communication device, um, we can uh, experience it and obtain information about um, urban spaces. Um, and uh, I, I use, as I said, the, the smartphone, uh, not only uh, a simple object that allow us to communicate uh, person to person, 
but um, that can uh, explore uh, the connecting peoples around the world and the um, communication about with uh, objects and people. So I explore the communicational and computational ubiquity um, and that promotes uh, higher levels of communication and interaction. So, um, considering this a tool, um, it, it allows us to extend the human uh, memory and give the, us a way of cyber users. So, the social interaction mediated by technology um, enunciates new ways of civic participation. Um, in increasing um, interactive territories. So, um, uh, and to uh, um, expand in the digital way this urban uh, space, um, we associate experience and properties of interaction and multidisciplinary um, communication uh, frame it from uh, these three scopes uh, space, interface and people. Uh, so I explore uh, art, science and technology with uh, locative media art um, and associate art, uh, technology, science and digital storytelling in artistic urban interventions um, based on mobile communications. So um, they can create um, a unique and subjective uh, locative experiences. Um, so the mainly is to uh, increase uh, public participation. So in this way, uh, new forms of um, appreciation, uh, comprehension, and uh, perception, perception. Uh, and interpretation of the urban are tested and, and contribute to critical thinking. So, um, the the easy um, online mapping tools uh, increases uh, to and allow us to map and make visible some process um, that to to comprehend this um, this um, a great diversity of data and um, um, and the marks that the experience of these individuals live on urban spaces. Um, Tell, tells, tell us the, um, the way they are um, living these spaces and interact with each other. So uh, urban space is an um, approach uh, multidimensionally in which experiences um, collective memories, individual emotions, dynamic flows, um, activities and appropriation um, rights uh, impregnate um, them with uh, topological uh, logics. So, uh, and that's why I think that justify the use of locative media art uh, to, to conforming this dynamic mapping and combining time and experience uh, and these dynamic apprehensions of urban form. So, um, according to uh, uh, Pred, and I quote, place are never finished, but always uh, becoming. So, in, in urban imaginaries, uh, Silva, in 2001, says that um, uh, co the idea of this constant, constant renewal by everyday and collective events um, 
advancing in an interdisciplinary perspective in the analysis of urban space, highlighting the importance of the collective imagination. So, um, I also have uh, more three references, the Lynch, Cullen and Jacobs, um, to this uh, special analysis from the visual component. So uh, they can also highlight new ways to concil conciliate the emotional and sensory uh, explore experience in the mental construction of urban image. So we, we start from the situationist legacy with the urban drifts to fill uh, the urban space but now with the different tools. So, um, we start to doing some uh, walking drift, uh, urban drifts um, without a previous path uh, to understand how uh, some uh, co collaborate, uh, participant, participants, collaborators, yeah? Uh, they react to the different spaces. So, uh, we, we want to associate the concept of the flaneur uh, now with the cyber flaneur. Uh, so, we explore the contribution of the smartphone uh, in this, in this um, uh, walking art practice. Um, and in an in interactive and playful way that can allow us to, to preserve or register the, the path. So we, we, we set some tracking APPs, uh, my maps and my, uh, my tracks, and we gave to the participants, to the different uh, 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 different um, urban actors. So they weren't uh, just tracking without knowing. No, they are uh, collaborating with us. So the, the paths they, they did, the, that different color is a different path. So we, we representing the individual, but the reflects on the collective way they, um, they, um, they, they interact with the space. So, quoting the wall, uh, each individual track record can also be aggregated and on a collective level, and this can lead to the visualization of collective rhythms in new ways. What is new in all these examples is that they extend the moment of the performance of social roles to additional platforms and additional publics as in audiences. So uh, by, start, by um, tracking that path and targeting uh, the, the spaces and the, the, the oral, the talks they had in that place, with the different uh, persons of the community, uh, we, we highlight that points, we, we target that points that are associated with different experience on that urban space. So I'm, I must refer that all these ex, uh, explorations are in a consolidated uh, urban uh, space. So, uh, after that, after we choose the, the points to target, uh, the community share and record videos and uh, image and um, with the different stories. Uh, for example, this is in north of Portugal. Um, it calls uh, Vila de Caminha. And they, uh, uh, in, the, in the sex and the, 60s, uh, I would say, generation of 60 years, they all told stories to the, um, relating to the time of the Portuguese political police, the uh, speed, and, the, and 
that was um, responsible for suppression of freedom and, and liberty of thoughts and movements. And they controlled the, the, the border with Spain and there was a lot of um, stories about that. So we geolocated that narratives, that stories, and we attached to, the, to that particular space with um, uh, that digital content relating data, memories, location, and mobility. So in, um, in a symbiosis of spaces uh, and working with uh, virtual reality, augmented reality, and mixed reality, we, we compile uh, different uh, data, image, text, sounds uh, into that. So we think that we consolidate the notion that um, urban spaces have stories and that can be captured and record and share inter and trans um, uh, dimensionally. So, uh, that experience was the first experience, and uh, we understand that it is possible to write, add information, and express uh, views and opinions, and put that uh, opinions in digital space that we can um, assess in physical space. So, um, collect consolidation, that um, collective memory. So uh, then we, s we, we did more uh, for experience and um, exploring that uh, attributes of space, different space, and, um, and uh, the different experience of collaborative mapping in consolidated urban spaces um, constitute a process in which they allow to uh, a noted and attack, attached image information, sounds, uh, contextualization, that information. So, um, so the, um, that uh, collective and collaborative map was also um, useful for the students because they could um, they could um, uh, write uh, proposals in that map in, in real time. Um, they, they put the, um, some strategies they were thinking, and in some, some of them are in Lisbon, some of them are in the north of Portugal, and they, they could um, comment the ideas of each other in real time. So, in digital environment. So it was a, um, a base of discuss, uh, uh, discussing and a critical also about that place. So um, then we, we, that was a, a, a way of getting different inputs to, 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 to then uh, work the, by um, in a vis in a visually uh, maps. So this instru instrumental component of the collaborative map um, allow us uh, to get significant um, understand of different urban flows, uh, utilizing. Um, use it as a tool of, for interpretation, local dynamics, making uh, itself a dynamic and interactive map in real time. So, um, then it, this is another experience that the, in a collaborative mode, they, they it was just in an afternoon, and they they produce a lot, a lot of data. So uh, they put, they insert different to different information, videos, uh, positive positive um, information, negative information, uh, what they feel, what the what they suggest, uh, um, the the they 
track their path and they record some conversations with the locals. So that, that information about the positive points and the negative points, we, we uh, georeferenced that annotations and um, uh, during the urban drifts and um, and they were very relevant for the interoperability between the locative media uh, drafts and the um, ABMS interface that was developed by um, a colleague in this master thesis that it calls Tiago Gomes. So the, the urban drifts gets inputs to this uh, in the humanistic perspective to, to this analysis. So, uh, so then we export this data information obtained in local um, by the collaborative mapping and uh, to this interface. And um, we, we put these inputs in these agent-based analysis. So the, the good points, the, the green points they consider, it, we translate to the uh, sp special points of attractions, attractors. And the bad points, the negative things they, they consider, we put in the repulsive deflectors to which these agents will uh, simulate social behavior in flows and movements, as you see. So, um, I think the research gains more complex levels, and at this point, um, uh, regarding the interdependence uh, with the morphological approach and uh, this agent-based analysis. So, um, we start. Uh, we we did more four or five experiments like this, so, and we are getting more and more uh, participants. Uh, so we started to getting a huge amount of information. So um, in this period of this discussion, we have different inputs from different actors. So we we promote the e-participation, but we need to quantific quantification and measurability uh, of this data process. And this is um, something we have to work. So, but the, the more than the technological experience in, in these uh, five experience, uh, we highlight the the, um, the artifacts place the emphasis on the relevance of the social process. This cultural process, this community involvement was amazing. And the interactions um, between intergenerational was amazing also. So we highlight the importance of the dialogue and being together to to, to improve the content, the knowledge, and the information of urban uh, fluxus and urban um, what is this going on. So we want to focus on these community-based solutions. And uh, in kind of conclusion, we need to uh, work in, now in a different level. We want to, um, we, with this experience, we could, we, we, we had shift this correlation between community engagement, e-participation and collaborative process. We, we noticed that uh, the community wants to participate, but it needs to be um, instigate, you know, because for themselves, they don't, they don't want to participate, but if you promote uh, events, if you promote dialogues, if you promote, uh, and with the technology, uh, it was uh, a good experience. So the future work will be a platform for this cultural and participation process in urban co design. And 
we want to integrate this new uh, next step of this experience in the work of uh, the David was talking about yesterday uh, with APP Leash and that he was talking the the and this this uh, this important this importance of the community participating so thank you so, questions please i just have a quick question you uh, i saw in one of the slides you have emotional sensory experience and uh, i was wondering if you started to measure that yet through questionnaires or posts or heart beating or any sort of uh, caption that you were doing together with the uh, cell phone applications? The first experience, the, um, the participations were students at different levels. It was at uh, I, I students levels and the um, university of the um, master's degree. So at the, after the urban uh, draft, they have to uh, comp compile these, um, they have to track and compile these feelings and everything they, f and uh, record the talks and they, they have to put everything in the video. So it's, um, it's a way they've, they've transmit what they feel in the end. But um, another, um, the application of the smartphone, it, uh, they record the, the, the velocity, uh, velocity, velocity, higher, um, a lot of parameters. So now we have, we feel the, the, the need to uh, quantify uh, that, that information. But you didn't use the the bit of the no no okay no more questions. Uh, you have a wonderful case study. What a beautiful complex and uh, quite challenging. Um, you showed us uh, your analysis of the transformation on on the surface, external surface. Do you intend to analyze the internal and uh, you know changes? Uh, uh, how will you do it with shape grammar? Uh, which kind of, uh, of tool you'll use to understand uh, the different changes? I'm sure that it happened inside, even though the plans are quite small, but uh, uh, you, you can never imagine how creative, again, using People difficult work, but anyway, they can manage to, to transform the space. Okay. Yes, it's, it's a very challenging site, by the way. I, I've been there once for my research and I could only, I mean, pick the blocks because it was huge, so I, I didn't know where to work exactly. So at the end of the next month, I'll go to do the second part of my uh, field research. And in that case, I'm planning to visit the interiors of the houses. But I don't know how many houses I could enter what kind of data I could gather. I think that the tool that I will be using are dependable on the data that I will collect. So for now, it's uh, uh, quite ambiguous. I don't know yet, but uh, soon I will find out. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, Jyoti. It's also a question for Amina. Uh, I like very much the presentation. I, I would like to know if you think it is feasible to apply your methodology uh, to other case studies, because your case study, uh, the basis is already uh, very strict, ruled yes. uh, in terms of composition. So what can happen from change is already controlled. Do you think it is feasible in other cases, more complex, uh, to use your methodology, or is too much complex? I think it, it depends. We started as modernist housing blocks, so th that was the, the study which the study based on. So yes, Climat de France is a very strong uh, case, but there are so many other repetitive, especially in social housing. Yeah, that's the way we do it. I mean, to be fast, cheap, it's generally repetitive and uh, huge. So <laughs> that's why 
I think that it can be applicable. Yeah, that's why I attended this study, but it needs to be tried and yeah, justified. Probably you can work with David yeah. in the, yes, <laughs> the project. I was very uh, happy, pleased to see him as a ch in, the, in this discussion. Another question? Um, I was looking for the note. <laughs> uh, at some point at the end of your presentation, you said uh, uh, you rose a few questions, and one of those was if the, the grammar could uh, predict or something like that uh, further changes. No. No. Not no. predict, but can we evaluate? I mean, by using these analysis, can we uh, produce? a more adapt context adaptable rehabilitation of the existing projects. But uh, in the sense that uh, to, to build a structure that would be more uh, easy to make adaptations or to have uh, this coded in some sort of grammar to make the diff the, these modifications. This is the part that I didn't understand. Yeah, it's in my case study, this particular project, it's most of them wants, uh, the residents wants them to be demolished. So we, we have many cases, for example, Robin Hood uh, housing complex in London, it doesn't exist anymore, etc. So this is probably the future of most of these complexes. So therefore, maybe we can propose a rehabilitation, a reno renovation project for these cases that would make uh, residents feel, yeah, belong more or feel more comfortable, maybe, through analyzing uh, their struggle with the space. This is what I'm looking for. Just the microphone. Work, and uh, it would be Very, very often uh, we would have studies like that because these, we can retire patterns. Uh, well, uh, looking floors. Uh, uh, well, you discovered an issue in your uh, in your uh, example because it's uh, very uh, orientates the pattern. But uh, I think that we can. Uh, uh, d develop more general patterns than what you are uh, uh, studying. And, uh, well, those patterns, I think they demonstrate the conflict between the architect and the user. And this is very important to the architect. <laughs> Where is the conflict? And I don't say the user is right. I think many times the architect is right. But, f for example, if the user makes change because of uh, clim climate uh, 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 condition, I would say the, uh, the architect is uh, wrong. <laughs> if he does because of uh, other things, maybe the, the architect is right and the user is wrong. Uh, I don't know. Uh, but this is a discussion that uh, would be very, very, very interesting and... Uh, uh, well, for the work of the architect, I think it would be exemplary. Uh, it's a necessary work that uh, I, I don't see many, many uh, work done in this uh, in this kind of uh, of problems. That I think it's uh, very, very important. I, uh, well, I don't know, but uh, maybe you don't know. But in Portugal, there is a, a conflict that we over know is the closing of the balcony. <laughs> The architect opens the balcony and the user closes the balcony. Who is right? <laughs> More questions? Uh, I have a question for you. Uh, you show us how you, uh, in a way, try to structure the, um, the, the, the place, the building. And um, how about the appropriations? Uh, do, you, do you have some kind of uh, uh, rules to structure the, the, the sort of appropriation that you are going to identify? And uh, is there a kind of criteria for those you consider useful for the uh, reappropriation, for the uh, rehabilitation, or, and those that you do not? And if you are going to do this, 
how is the, the balance between the, those you consider positive and those you consider negative, and where do the people that did this transformation enter or not? Yes, I think that's the most critical standing point of yeah. the whole research. And I think it's really crucial to uh, get in touch with the residents themselves. So, um, since I still don't know why they did those transformations, uh, I can only assume some uh, reasons. But yet, I think that um, you you point out you pointed out something very important. I mean, if it's climatic, if it's cultural, mm -hmm. because they need more privacy, that's crucial to the rehabilitation, rehabilitation probably. But there are other problems as well, because in this case, it's really a ghetto, and people are very angry. They are very um, they they don't like uh, the authority. They don't like the country. They want to damage everything. That's why. Not everything that they are doing makes sense. So I think in that aspect, it would be easier to categorize them. But yet, it's just an assumption for now. And then they will enter in the process of the, OK, OK. Yeah, they should. More questions? Uh, if there's any other question, uh, I just have, want to add something to the presentation of Isabel. Uh, this symposium, uh, for the first time, has this uh, scientific field, mapping and tracking, uh, exactly because we, for two reasons uh, mainly. Uh, one of them was the sort of data that you can collect from devices like this. It's also data that we can work with when working with uh, urban planning or architecture. And the other one was, of course, this... Um, uh, issue about uh, uh, the people, the, that data come from people. That, that is not always from space and only from space, but also from people and to engage people within this process in a, a non-direct and direct way of doing it. So uh, this is something that we would like to uh, boost within the symposium, the relation between the empirical approaches and these kind of more quantitative ones and how to get data quantific capable from empirical um, approaches. So this is something that we will try to uh, move on and to, to work on mainly. And uh, all the contributions that you think you can add to us, they will be more than welcome. And we thank you for that. Um, if anything else for now, uh, I would uh, recommend a short coffee to try to get back on schedule um, and then back to the final uh, session. Thank you.